Hi, I'm Sachi Yanari Rizzo, Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. And every other month we hold print talks in the Print and Drawing Studies Center. And for this month, we will be focusing on three different African-American printmakers who are, whose works are on view. So you can, you're welcome to come in during the week between 11 and three to see the works in person. Um, I'm also joined here by, with Caitlin Binkley who um, will watch for questions, any questions in the comments field. So the three artists we're gonna be looking at are um, Karsten Kreitney, um, Steve Prince, and Althea Murphy-Price. There we go. Um, and we're, we're looking at them because I find that they all use imagery in a very interesting way um, in terms of using it as metaphors and as, as symbols. So the first artist we're looking at is Karsten Kreitney. Um, he was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's the son of two immigrant parents. His father's family came from Jamaica in the 1950s and his mother was born in Denmark. Here I have a um, an important influence artistically in his life was his uncle. Um, his works by Durrell Crichtney are on the right-hand side. Um, Crichtney's uncle was a skilled street photographer and became known for his portraits of musicians documenting the Chicago jazz scene. And um, it's very interesting to note that he opened the first Black-owned commercial photography, photography studio in Chicago in 1969. Um, and even more than um, the photographs themselves, uh, his uncle was an inspiration, um, giving Crichton the idea that he could potentially work as an, um, as an artist. Crichton earned his BA in studio art in 2000 from Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Um, the college exposed him to printmaking for the first time and also promoted experiential learning. So as an undergraduate, um, he apprenticed for this experiential learning component for the university um, with New York City's print publishers, Solo Impression um, and Pace Editions. In 2001, he explored printmaking further by going through Tamarin Institute's intensive professional printers training um, that focuses on the technical skills of lithography. And Tamarin really promoted um, artists to use lithography um, as um, to add to their printmaking um, skills. Afterwards, he received his MFA in painting and drawing in 2011 at the University of New Mexico um, in Albuquerque. And Crichtney is currently assistant professor there in printmaking and teaches classes at Tamarin Institute. So the first work we have by Crichtney is entitled The Burial. Um, it's from 2009 and is a lithograph. Um, and you'll see that each of the prints bring together different elements, kind of like a collage. And the work consists of nine individual prints, um, even though they could be kind of viewed as kind of discrete independent works, but together they kind of create also a collage of images that help tell a story. And Crichtney suggests that the prints can be arranged in any configuration. I've seen them arranged in just a very linear fashion with all nine in a, in a single row. Um, but you start to see some, this, this con particular configuration was um, suggested by um, Joe Zanata who was who published the print for, um, for Christ. Over here to the right-hand side, you have a path that kind of um, continues through a couple prints. And we see recurring paths throughout the entire nine prints, um, cloud patterns, and a continuous horizon line. And these all try to um, help to unite the prints, all the nine prints. The road is a powerful theme throughout his work, signifying life's journey. Um, he explained, I see the road as a metaphor for our lives, a powerful symbol of movement, adventure, and transformation. The road connects where we've been with where we are now and where we hope to be going. 
And so, as I mentioned, this is a lithograph. And so this was printed at Tamarin Institute when Crichton was still in graduate school. Um, and it really shows the artist's love of the medium um, for its ease and its versatility. Uh, many of the panels include laser printing transfers. So we see that in a lot of the flowers that were cut out and some of the figures. Um, and these are all transferred to the stone and he could still continue to draw, continue to draw on the stone with little crayon and touche to add a variety of marks and textures and tones. And if we go to the next image, um, this is a detail of one of the lines um, of, of, the, of the burial. And you'll notice that flowers are frequent, a frequent motif in many of his paintings and drawings and prints. Um, they range from detailed studies, much like portraits of flowers to lush landscapes invoking um, paradise. We see here the flowers are highly individualized. They're relatively large in scale and very prominently placed in the foreground. So these roadside flowers seem to be, um, seem to reappear in a lot of the images in this piece and um, almost become observers or kind of surrogates for any kind of human presence. And they seem to bear witness to the events that are unfolding throughout the, the series. So in these prints, the, in this set of prints, um, the landscape seems to be pretty optimistic, holding promise for the future of the young man that we see in the distance. Oops, if we go to another detail, um, the focus on the plants begin to diminish and that sun-filled vegetation gives way to this ominous tone that we see in the clouds, darkened clouds and the sky and skeletal faces appear along with a freshly dug grave and then also um, tombstones. And then one of his other prints in, this, in, the, in the piece, there's also a funeral band that plays. plays. This is another piece on the, on the left-hand side that we own entitled Man with Burning House. It's a woodcut from 2014. And it's, the image itself isn't very big. It's about 15 by 11 inches. Um, if you look at, your, at the work by Crichton online, you'll find that he likes to work in, um, in addition to prints, he likes to work in photography and collage and painting. And he likes to piece fragments that he collects scavenge from old paintings and prints, books, magazines, newspapers and paper, because they offer him a variety of images and colors and textures. And so on the right hand side, um, from the Richard Levy Gallery, we have one um, mixed media piece entitled Street Musician, where if we look right here, we see his print Man um, with Burning House. So he's even used one of his own woodcuts for um, one of these collaged elements. So he likes to, uh, so he likes to how these combined elements find new context then um, in these arrangements in these imagined landscapes. Collage is a style that he relates to um, jazz music for its expressive and improvisational qualities. Um, some artists might, you know, like to work through preparatory sketches and have very much a preconceived notion mapped out in advance. But instead, Crichton explains, my work is, is a, as much a product of discoveries made while making it as it is deliberate. It is much is more orchestrated than fully controlled. Another work um, that we have on view by Crichton is Lamenting Man on the left hand side from 2012. It's also a woodcut. Um, Crichton often turns to relief printing using linoleum, which we call linocut, and woods. So not surprisingly, he has expressed an admiration for German expressionist printmakers from the early 20th century, including Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, Karl Schmidt Rotloff, and then we have an example from our collection by Eric Heckel on the right hand side um, from 1919. So Crichton and the German expressionist artists like Heckel love the woodcut medium, um, especially for its immediacy and its evocative power. And what we see in um, Crichton's Lamenting Man is 
very expressive gouges made into the block in the wood and angular distorted forms that really emphasize that sorrow. And the gambler is the last piece that we, uh, final piece that we own by Crichtony. Um, it was done in 2012. And again, the image is not very big. It's about 13 by 13 inches. Um, in the gambler, we see cards or maybe they're dollar bills that lay on the ground. And the young man is rolling the dice in a game of chance. Crichtony commented, we are all risk takers. There's these moments in life where we have to make a choice. I'm interested in the moments where the future is uncertain, you're rolling the dice and seeing where it lands. And I have a detail on the left-hand side to show you that um, this is a combination of lino cut and sheen collet, and so was um, Man with Burning House as well. Um, through his work with lithography, Crichton discovered very delicate Japanese papers, which are tend to be very thin, but very strong sheets. Um, this led him to using shin kale. Um, it's a, a technique in which you print directly on one sheet of paper, often Japanese paper, and th that also becomes adhered to a second supporting sheet. So we see this on the left. You can see that there's this really delicate um, sheet here that he's printed on. And this is another supporting sheet that's a little lighter in color. Um, perhaps the artist liked the slight color that the Japanese paper offered on the way, um, or the way that um, the paper picks up the ink. Papers like Gampi, Kozo, and Mulberry are very responsive and very sensitive to receiving the subtle marks from the plate. So they're really, they really pick up the ink well. Um, the paper actually used for man with burning house, um, you'll have to come in and look at it. It has a really beautiful luster that really doesn't translate um, in images. Um, the other part of the technique that he uses in the gambler is lino cut. So it's done um, on a linoleum, piece of linoleum. Um, that he carves. Um, but this is interesting because um, it is an example of reduction lino cut in which the artist uses a single block to print all the layers, all the colors of the print rather than using a different block for each color. Um, so he carved the blocks so that he could print from light to dark. So he was printing first blue, then gray, and then the black inks. And Crichtony had to carve away small amounts of linoleum, printing in blue ink first and leaving the white of the paper in the clouds. Um, shirt and dice. So for each layer, the artist has to print a total, the total number of sheets at once he intends for the addition. So um, when he's printing the blue, he will do, if it's an addition of 15, he will print um, on all 15 sheets. And you do that for every layer. So, um, so this would have been followed by additional carving on the same block for overprinting using the opaque gray ink. Um, and then he prints that on all the impressions. And then black is left for the end, including all the small gouges to form the grass, or maybe that's gravel. Um, when the black ink overprints, that gray texture pattern emerges. So as the artist removed more linoleum with each layer, less and less of the block remained. Um, and uh, so later additions cannot be printed since since the residual carving that's left over on the block is only for that black ink layer, for that final layer. And if you're, that was kind of a wordy explanation. If you're interested in seeing um, more um, visually how this is done, um, I've given you a link to a video on Pablo Picasso's Still Life Under a Lamp um, at the British Museum because they go through layer by layer showing you um, how he's carved more and more of the block and, and printed all the layers. And Picasso was really um, quite a master of the reduction um, line of cut process. The second artist we're gonna look at is Steve Prince. And um, as you can see from the two images, um, he works in printmaking, especially in line of cut and um, drawing large scale. Um, He's a native of New Orleans and comes from a creative family with siblings who are in the visual and performing arts. 
Um, he attended Xavier University in Louisiana on a basketball scholarship. But it was John T. Scott who introduced him to printmaking and kind of the possibilities of art. Um, Prince ended up graduating with a BF, BFA um, from Xavier. Subsequently, he attended his mentor's alma mater um, at Michigan State University, where he received his MFA in printmaking and sculpture. And currently, he's the director of engagement at Muscarelli Museum of Art and is a distinguished artist in residence there. And I found this nice image on the right hand side on his Facebook page to give you kind of a sense of scale that he works on. Um, this is a um, he's in both cases, he's working on a linoleum um, block. And, and this is a very recent acquisition. As you can see, we just purchased it in, um, at the end of 2020. Um, this is entitled Rosa Sparks. Um, it's a lino cut. It's from 2017 and it is fairly large scale. Um, it's about 36 by 49 inches. Um, in 2017, Segura Art Studio um, that was formerly located at the University of Notre Dame um, invited Prince to do a 10 day artist in residency in which he led community programs and, and um, created Rosa Sparks here and then also Salt of the Earth, um, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, Prince enjoys mixing up historical and contemporary references. So his work can continue to hold meaning over time. So first we see the civil rights icon Rosa Parks stand out. Um, we see her with a stylized halo be behind her head, and she's interacting with a scowling bus driver. So this references the historical moment when Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white passenger. And this occurred in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. In Prince's title, he makes a play on word with her, her name by calling the print Rosa Sparks. Um, as her actions were a spark or a catalyst for the widespread bus boycotts. Black people protested this form of segregation by refusing to ride Montgomery buses for 13 months, culminating with this US Supreme Court ruling that segregation on public buses was un unconstitutional. And adding, adding layers of meaning to his work, um, Prince uses utilizes his, his religious faith um, that has guided his art and his life. Um, he refers to himself often as an art evangelist. Um, we notice that Parks is not dressed in 1950s clothing. Instead, she looks like she's clad in armor. And then also, I'll try to show you right here, she has this little badge and it says AOG. Um, those are the initials, which Pris refers to as the armor of God. And he says, this is taken from Paul in his letter to the Ephesians saying that we must don the whole armor of God because we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and things in high places. And we see silhouetted in the back. Um, we have a man in chains, he's enslaved. Also, we have all these picketers um, silhouetted in the back. Um, some march um, reminiscent carrying that I am sign reminiscent of the I am a man placards used in protests throughout the civil rights movement. And we see an example of that in Ernest Withers photographs of the sanitation workers strike here on the right hand side. And this is also in our collection. Yeah, to, so you can see this a little bit better. Um, throughout the bus, Prince mixes in references to, to people and figures from different points in history. And there is an X um, referring to Malcolm X. You've got a, a little crown here um, referring to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., both of whom were assassinated. Up in this left-hand area, we have E.T. Um, referring to Emmett Till. Um, he was a young 14 year old boy from Chicago who was brutally murdered in 1955 while visiting family for supposedly flirting with a white woman. Then we fast forward to the 21st century. Um, we've got the man is 
towards the back of the bus, a man is steadying himself, but by doing so, he holds his up, arms up, reminding us of 18-year-old Michael Brown, whose hands were raised in surrender prior to being fatally shot by an officer in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. And the hands up, don't shoot became a rallying cry during the protests. Um, there's a young man dressed in the hoodie, in a hoodie all the way to the left-hand side here. Um, this is 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. He's holding a can of Arizona iced tea because he was found with, with only Skittles and iced tea on him. And the design on Martin's um, hoodie spells out cool with a K, um, like the cigarette, the cool cigarette brand. And this is because the New York um, Police Department had first approached Eric Garner in 2014 under the suspicion of selling cigarettes without tax stamps before putting him in a chokehold. Um, sadly, there are numerous other Black men and women who could be added to the bus. Um, on a more hopeful note, though, we have a secular Madonna and child here on the lower left side. Um, and this grouping shows the child giving what seems to be reminiscent of like the sign of benediction. Perhaps the mother opens up her Bible with a section from Matthew reading, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. And this is salt of the earth. Um, this is the other print that was created at Segura Art Studio. Um, and this was done in 2017. Um, and it is a lithograph again. And the historical event that Salt of the Earth evokes is from February 1st, 1960, when four freshman students at North Carolina A&T College staged the iconic sit-in at the Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, African-Americans were permitted to shop at Woolworths, but the lunch counter was not integrated. When the young students were ordered to leave, they refused to give up their seats and remained there until close and returned the following day with other students. The next image, this, this has a historic uh, photograph of the Greensboro Four um, in comparison. Again, this was an event that was a spark like Rosa Parks. Um, this protest, it, protest ignited student involvement across the country, and by March, there were 55 sit-ins in lunch counters in 13 states. On July 25, 1960, African-American kitchen workers became the first African-Americans to be served at that same Greensboro lunch counter. Today, the Woolworth store is home to the International Civil Rights Center and Museum and a portion of the lunch counter can be seen at the National Museum of American History. And Prince emphasizes the courage and value of these four young men as we see the tail end of the Woolworth sign and it focuses on the, the word worth that's prominent in the background. The title now is an idiom, salt of the earth, meaning honest and noble individuals. Its origin is from scripture actually, um, salt, has been important throughout history, used as a currency, food preservation, and burial customs. Prince explained, I use the idea of salt to represent us because we are supposed to be preservers of truth and what is right and just. Salt was, just, salt was and is one of the world's most important and plenteous spices as we are. Val valuable, plenteous, and important. Let's go to a, a full image of salt of the earth. So like Rosa Parks, the young men do not wear clothes from the 1960s. There's headbands and jackets that all kind of take on sort of a futuristic geometric form. Um, they have a texture of metal rather more than fabric. One st student bears the AOG monogram on his shoulder here. Um, again, standing for armor of God. Prince creates a tabletop graveyard with objects we see it to the um, on the counter on the right. Um, some of the objects resemble headstones that cast a shadow of doubt over the texts that that say love, freedom, truth. However, um, there is a hopeful symbol in the um, the dove we see over here on the right hand side, um, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So in both prints by Prince. He alludes to specific historic moments, but he makes his subtle changes so that the work can continue to resonate 
um, in other contexts and in, in, in the future and, and even now. Um, Prince cites the influence of artists such as John Biggers, Elizabeth Catlett, Aaron Douglas, Jacob Lawrence, and Charles White. And I couldn't, um, I really wanted to include an image of Charles White on the right hand side. Um, Prince is on the left working on a large scale um, drawing that would have been included in um, Art Prize in Grand Rapids. And even a, so, and, and Char Charles White is on the right working on a mural. We'll look at another image comparing the two. Uh, maybe you can see sort of the influence that I'm seeing. Both artists communicate their subject's strength and power through dramatic modeling um, seen in the faces um, and throughout the figure. Lithography is really truly the perfect medium to create these really beautiful tonal gradations, um, very much resembling a pencil drawing, but this is still a print medium. And, and you'll notice that the hands are very powerful and prominent in location and very large in scale. And so that's, these are some of the reasons why his work, Prince's work reminds me of Charles White. The last artist we're gonna talk about is Althea Murphy Price. Um, she uses hair to explore aspects of identity. Althea Murphy Price was born in San Jose, California, um, but grew up in Boulder, Colorado. She has a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Spelman College, um, a master's degree in painting and printmaking from Purdue University in West Lafayette. She also has an MFA in printmaking from um, Tyler School of Art, which is at Temple University. And today she teaches at one of the most highly regarded printmaking programs in the country at University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And this is a small scale work that we have um, in the collection. We um, only have this single work by um, Murphy Price. Um, we have this really beautiful swatch of graceful lines down here um, resembling what looks to be like a hair extension possibly that curls and hangs down. And if that's the case, um, we have this beautiful intricate network of lines in the background, wiry and wavy um, that very much look like, you know, hair that's kind of fallen onto the ground. Um, Murphy Price uses hair as both subject and process chosen for color, texture, and its relationship to the body as a way of talking about social identity. It's a means to examine her own questions relating to race and gender. She explores questions how she came to understand concept, uh, concepts of beauty and who she is. She says, I felt very under, underrepresented as a child and my hair was the thing that very clearly differentiated me from my friends. So there's always a subjective connection to thinking about hair as a cultural identifier. So for her, uh, hair serves as a springboard to look at history, definitions of beauty and assimilation. In society, hair can be used as a form of self-expression, um, but can take on social and political meanings anywhere from something negative like a stigma against black hairstyles to reclaiming natural hair as a sign of black empowerment. Uh, Murphy Price finds inspiration in printed media, whether it's Ebony Magazine or other ad advertisements, all instances that commodify the body. And the way she uses hair is not in a, in a normal context, like in a portrait. Um, instead, she's eliminated the face and the body. And I wanted to include a comparison um, of a work by Lorna Simpson that's in the collection, but it's not on view because it is a large scale installation. Um, it's entitled Wigs, it's from 1994. It's a lithograph on felt. Um, and it's a pretty large scale piece. Overall, when it's all pinned to the wall, it's about 162 inches across. In Lorna Simpson's work, hair becomes the subject and medium as well. Um, she presents a series of wigs, all in different styles. We have um, examples of hair being coiled and braided, flowing, um, netted. Um, and uh, the wigs are pinned to the wall um, with little sewing pins. Um, they're pinned in the corners. And um, what it reminds me of is like uh, one of those butterfly collections that um, you would find in natural history museums or um, um, science centers, ones that are collected for identification. 
So the artist Simpson in this case even extends the reference to hair one step further by printing on felt, which heightens this connection with hair. Um, felt gives the actual texture of hair um, in, this, in the printed image, plus felt is often made of wool. So it, it's being made, it makes that connection with another living being. In wigs, Simpson explores the issue of beauty as well, revealing how people, especially African-American women are identified and classified. Like Murphy Price, she omits most of the most, the most identifiable, an identifiable feature, the face. Um, so without the face, we have to ask ourselves, what assumptions are we making about individuals based on appearance um, without any extra information? So in this case, uh, looking at hairstyle alone. We go back to um, Althea Murphy Price's works. Uh, these are other examples of what she's done. Um, we looked at how hair is the subject of Murphy Price's work, but it's also important as, to her as a material and in her process. The artist began working with hair back in graduate school. So she uses natural hair and also synthetic hair, um, literally in the printing of her work. Um, so she, she'll take actual hair material um, in a, and use it in a photographic print process called photolithography. The artist then can compose and arrange the hair directly on a photolitho plate, um, which is sensitive to light. Um, so when it's exposed to a strong light source, the hair then, um, the hair, her arrangement that she's composed on the plate um, blocks out the light. Through a photographic process, then the image is transferred to the plate and then can be printed with ink. Um, and although Murphy Price um, teaches printmaking, she also works in sculpture and photography. On the right hand side, we have In Her Place, um, which is a really beautiful floor piece that she's made with clipped hair that's been put through a stencil to make these really beautiful lacy patterns that remind me of um, uh, Middle Eastern textiles carpets. We go back to the piece in our collection. It's entitled Wearing, the ba Wearing a Badge from 2014. And we think of what exactly is a badge. Um, it's a distinctive emblem worn as a mark of office, membership, achievement, something basically used for identification and categorization. Um, so it's an interesting title given that the hair extension is artificial. So Murphy Price often uses synthetic hair, as I mentioned, and synthetic hair is made out of plastic or nylon. So it's in essence is made to look like an idealized strand of human hair. She explains, its deceptiveness is what I find intriguing. And so indicative of a society that seems obsessed with the superficial. So she uses printmaking um, as a method to create this de deception. Um, Murphy Price takes a real object, often ironically a synthetic um, piece of hair made to, that's made to mimic real hair and makes a printed copy. It looks identical in size and texture. And as one writer put it, the print mimic, uh, mimics objects which are themselves a deceit. And um, in closing, um, I thought I would uh, provide some extra references. I know some of you enjoy reading books or looking further into some of the artists that we talk about. And since many of us are still spending a lot of time at home, um, I found some um, references on site. Karsten Kreitney has a really nice um, interview, um, short interview um, at the, the web link below. Um, it's often so nice to hear actually from the artists, him, him by the artists themselves. And then P there's a PBS video, sort of a short documentary on Steve Prince. Um, he talks about his work in this um, segment and then also talks about some community programs that he's, um, he's been working on. And then lastly, Althea Murphy Price is in an exhibition at the Hunts Huntsville Museum of Art. And um, online, there is a catalog that you can read through. And she's supposed to have a studio tour, um, a studio visit that you can register to um, watch virtually. And this was supposed to be aired today, but it got canceled. So hopefully they'll, they'll announce a rescheduled time. Um, as I mentioned, please come in and see some of these works that are currently on view in the Print and Drawing Study Center. They'll be up through the end of February. And you can join us again in April 
um, for a print room talk when we'll be focusing on the work of Jennifer Bartlett and Elizabeth Murray.